This video documents the two month long journey of me building what I think is my greatest creation yet. It's a long one and it's gonna go fast. So get a snack, grab a drink, buckle up. Hope you enjoy. Welcome back box gang. As you guys know, we have one open wall left here in the build that we need to fill. And we've got a little bit of a problem because we have multiple functionalities that we need to include in this available space. We need a dining room, we need a living room, and we need a bed, a queen size bed to sleep two people. And unfortunately for me, there were no YouTube videos for me to watch of somebody building a dining room plus a living room plus a bedroom all in one in a very tiny space inside of a U-Haul. And so we had to create something entirely original. We're gonna be starting off this project by creating a bench style seating area. And I'm gonna be starting that with, of course, the most difficult way possible, creating my own custom cushions and seats and backrests. This will be my second ever upholstery project. The first one was our Murphy desk bench that sits on the other side of the box. This is gonna be very similar in that we're using kind of a white faux leather to finish these with a two inch foam cushion. We're making six individual cushions here, three for seats and three for backrests because I want this system to be as modular as possible. If I was making one large bench, I could just make two large cushions, but I want this to be configurable in either a bench style fashion or two seater style fashion with a wood table in the middle. I think these cushions turned out quite well for the level of experience I've got with upholstery, which is basically zero. So we can go ahead and move on to my favorite aspect of any project, which is over-engineering. I'm designing this bench to lay completely flat up against the wall when it's not in use. And so when we want to use it as a bench or seat, we need to be able to fold it up. That requires us to put this not only on a hinge, but also drawer slides so that we have it as an extending feature so that it can reach out beyond the depth of the backrest when we fold it up. I know this is probably a little bit hard to conceptualize right now, but trust me, you'll see exactly what I'm talking about later in the video. So I found and ordered some special drawer slides that are only a few inches long and attach these using dimensional lumber to the bottom of our seats. Nobody's really ever gonna see this, so it's okay that it doesn't look too fantastic. And now that we have our linearly articulating bench seats, we can go ahead and attach our hinges to the back of that and move on to creating some leg structures for the seats themselves. I'm creating my own custom extending aluminum legs out of one inch aluminum square tubing. I found some locking hinges that we can use to mount these flush underneath the benches themselves. And now you can understand why we have that one inch gap underneath the bench. So this design allows the benches to be folded flush up against the wall with the legs completely hidden inside the bench itself. This hole will later be used for our pin to lock in the extending legs. I can't fully complete the leg systems of these benches until we know exactly how far they are sitting above the ground. So now I'm gonna get to work on the platform on which these seats will actually be mounted. We're using half inch ply and I'll be routing out sections where the hinges will be able to sit within the wall, but also lie flush on the wall.
After attaching our bench seats, we can work on the wall panel for our backrests. At this point, you can probably start to see the big picture coming together. I'm going to be utilizing a set of wood slides on the backs of these backrests in order to allow me to slide the backrest up and down in order to accommodate the change in height of the seat as it goes from the folded position to the seating in use position. My strategy here was to glue the slides directly in place as they're attached to the backrests and let them dry overnight so that those slides are perfectly fit where I need them. My drying technique worked perfectly, but despite that, they did not slide out very well. It, it did work to some degree, but it did not attain the level of usability that I wanted in my final product. I attempted to remove some material from the slides with the sander in order to make it a little bit easier for it to slide, but that did not work still, so I ended up scrapping that idea. This is the first of many failed concepts as part of this live build process, and one of the reasons why these types of things take so long for me to build, because I don't know how to build them, and as I'm building it, I have to test out, prototype, and engineer as I go. My second attempt was to utilize some industrial Velcro that I had laying around from a previous project. With a little bit of contact cement and some staples to reinforce that, it actually ended up working out pretty good. This will stay in place when it's being used as a backrest, and then it's easily adjustable when we need to move it. One more cut of plywood gives us what is the third and final panel of what is to be our eventual wall. This wall is about 58 inches wide, whereas a standard sheet of plywood is only about 48 inches wide, meaning that I had to use two full-size sheets cut the long way in order to make this wall. And with that, it's finally time to fasten all three of these panels together and make one cohesive wall panel. went through and reinforced the entire length of the bed frame with screws and then it filled all the cracks with wood filler, sanded it down to a smooth finish to make it represent one solid cohesive piece as close as possible.
This wall panel serves as the foundation for all three of our functions that we need to fulfill. The dining room table, the bench, and the bedroom, or the bed. In order to perform as a Murphy bed, this whole entire panel must hinge off of a base unit. A base unit that is the exact same height as the legs that we just attached to the front of the wall panel. So that when the bed folds down 90 degrees onto the floor, the full length of those legs make contact with the floor in order to support the bed frame and the weight on the bed. I'm notching out space on the base unit here for the hinge to lie flush when it is closed. Using a chisel to outline where I need to notch out and going back with the router to take out the bulk of the material. Using offcuts from 2x4s, I'm building an internal frame for this base unit that should be strong enough to attach it to both the wall and the floor. Before we bring the wall into the truck for a dry fitting, I need to remove a small piece of the corner in order to accommodate the space where the closet will be when the bed is folded down. Luckily, my brother was visiting during this time and he was able to help me lift the wall frame into the truck before dry fitting. And we finally get the first look at our wall in action. Now I knew there was potential for large problems here if the hinges didn't align with the wall at the perfect level, meaning that this thing would not be flat on the ground when it's down in 90 degree position. But it turns out that sometimes things do go right on the first try. And with our first hinge test, we see that it lays down perfectly flat on the floor. Now that we have our wall in place, we can fasten our bench seats to the wall and measure the exact length of the leg extensions that we need to create. I 3D printed some feet to go on the ends of these legs to make sure that they won't scratch up my nice floors. I'm also installing a piece of aluminum angle at the bottom of the bed frame here in order to help hold up the bench seats when they are in the folded position. And with our legs finally complete, we can do our first load testing. Everything seemed pretty solid, pretty stable, pretty sturdy. The only problem was when we open our bench seats, the legs would just come flying out. So I 3D printed up some leg clips that hold them in place until we are ready to actually deploy the legs and extend them. Next, it was onto a wall latching mechanism. So we had a moving wall, but we had to find our way to actually make it stay in the upright position. I'm using the same clips that I used to keep my cabinets closed here. I think these are 12 pound clips, meaning they need 12 pounds of force in the lateral direction in order to open them. With the new latching mechanism in place, our wall can now stay in the up position in a secure manner. This allows us to complete the rest of the construction and beautification that we need to do to it.
it's time once again with our bed frame now installed and largely finished that we introduce a little more over engineering. Generally speaking, the main thing that you're paying for when you're buying a Murphy bed wall frame kit is the spring or lifting mechanism that actually assists you with lifting and lowering the bed frame. Now, like I said earlier in the video, there was nothing that would actually fit in a truck like this without taking up way too much space. But I still wanted to see if I could integrate some kind of lifting assist into the bed frame itself by using some 67 pound pneumatic gas struts. So I set out by first creating some aluminum frames that I can use to attach these struts to, which were made of some pretty thick aluminum angle that I trimmed down to fit in the bed frame itself and then drilled a bunch of holes into for fastening. I had to compress the gas lift in order to install this, so I used one of my hand clamps to compress the gas lift and then used some rebar wire to tie it shut. Initially, my aluminum bracket was getting caught on the base because I just hadn't trimmed out enough space for that to actuate up and down. So I had to go back and trim a little bit more off the base unit with my multi-tool. After that, we were free and clear to attach our gas struts. So we're about to test out these gas struts for the first time, see how they operate. And I will warn you ahead of time, this will be one of the most cringe inducing sounds you'll ever hear. These gas struts are very strong and it turns out that it's actually bending the bed frame closer to the ends of the bed. So what I need to do now is disassemble this whole thing and find out a way to reinforce it. I decided to add some fairly thick aluminum angle all the way along the edge of the bed frame. I'm also going to double the length of the hinges that I'm attaching to this for more equal weight distribution along the base. Actually, I actually have to correct myself, it's not weight distribution, it's actually force distribution. I lined the hinges up with the aluminum reinforcement and marked every single hole so that when these hinges attach to the bed frame now, they too will be reinforced by the aluminum angle.
hoping for no cringe-inducing sounds of my creations being destroyed before my eyes, we attempt our second test with the aluminum reinforcement installed. Not only are there no sounds, but this time the bed frame remains completely straight despite the force from the gas struts. The height of the bed was modified slightly due to the addition of that aluminum bracket, meaning I had to also move the latches holding the wall in place. With our primary Murphy mechanism now complete, we can move on to the third and final Murphy mechanism building into this wall, which is the table. Taking some initial measurements, I slowly come to the realization that I'm probably going to need to adjust the height of my backrests in order for me to put the table low enough to be comfortable. After contemplating for a significant amount of time whether there were any options available outside of disassembling my backrests and reupholstering them, I finally accept the fact that there is no real other option. Keeping in line with the overall theme of this video and the concept of what I like to call live prototyping, we are always making a couple steps backwards in order to make a step forward. This is the third significant obstruction so far in this project, and it won't be the last. During the process of trimming down these backrests, I actually irreparably damaged the upholstery on one, meaning I had to re-upholster the entire thing. Honestly though, these types of Roblox really only serve to make me more determined and more stubborn to get the job done. Not only that, but I want to push back on the universe even harder when it tries to put obstructions like this in my path. I will double down just to prove that I don't care about these kind of obstructions. Speaking of obstructions, turns out that by shortening my backrests, I actually exposed the Velcro that was sitting behind them, meaning that now I need to make an adjustment to my wall in order to fix that as well. Luckily, I keep a lot of scrap materials on hand specifically for this purpose. In case you guys are wondering why my garage is always so messy, that's the main reason. And in cases like right now, it came in quite handy because I happen to have some more of that wallpaper left over that I could use to patch over that Velcro spot. Two more obstructions out of the way, we can go ahead and finally move on to building a table. In true double down fashion, I ask myself, what's the most complicated possible way I could finish out this project? And the answer to that, of course, was try making your own epoxy resin deep pour table for the first time ever. Now, this of course was not my original plan, but during the build process, it turns out that I made a connection with a friend of a friend who knows a guy who has his own lumber mill. And he hooked me up with some pretty cheap red oak boards that I decided I could try and do an epoxy table with. And so, after planing these with my fancy new rigid planer to the appropriate thickness, go ahead and start the cleanup process of cleaning out all these little bug trails and getting the bark off. I've heard and seen quite a bit around the internet about how difficult epoxy resin pour tables are to make, but to be perfectly honest with you, I wasn't intimidated at all. Conceptually, the whole process made sense in my mind. I've seen enough Blacktail Studio videos on YouTube to where I've had a pretty good grasp of what needs to be done in what order. The only real significant difference between most tables and what I'm making is that my tables are going to be very, very thin in order to save on weight. So I go ahead and slap together a mold using Tyvek tape, of course, caulking all the corners to make sure that none of that epoxy will leak out during the curing process. The curing process for the resin that I'm using is probably about five days, so that's uh, quite a long time. I coat the edges with standard non-deep bore epoxy. Yes, they are different in order to seal those edges, although I think this was unnecessary. This is what the guy on the internet does, so I figured it's probably a good idea. It was pretty cold around recording of these videos here, and in order to accommodate the proper curing of the resin, I had to pour everything indoors. Dedicated some space in one of my closets to a curing area where I can keep a heater, make sure everything stays at a particular temperature. Weighed down my boards to prevent them from floating away with a couple of my weights and go ahead and start the pour. I definitely do not recommend using weights. I definitely do recommend using some kind of clamping system to keep your boards in place. As my resin was curing, again, that's a four to five day process. 
I built out a router sled that I could use to surface the entire face of my tables and get all the excess resin and wood off. This was simply a couple pieces of aluminum angle attached with some plywood and some screws. I don't know what happened to some of the footage there, but there wasn't much left in terms of build process anyway. So what you guys are witnessing here is round two for me because I am making again two tables. This is the real tabletop though. The other piece will be my table leg, if you will. And the routing with that didn't go as smoothly as I initially thought it would, but I was able to kind of refine the process as I went. So what you're gonna be witnessing here is actually my second attempt at using my router sled to surface a table. These boards were not perfectly straight or flat, which means that there was a little bit of extra epoxy on the edge that did not get removed with the router bit. So I had to go through and manually remove, scrape that off with a heater and a scraper. After that, it was hours and hours of neck breaking sanding all the way from 80 grit up to 320 grit before we got somewhat of a semi-gloss sheen on the wood without any kind of finish on there at all. Once we were finally sanded down, I took the table back inside to a warm environment where I could apply CA glue, which is basically black super glue into all the little tiny holes and cracks that were remaining. And these cracks and holes were revealed after the router sled took off extra material. So we're, we don't have to go back and use resin to fill these holes. We can use this black CA glue that will quickly dry and allow me to sand this. With all holes filled and everything smooth as glass, it was time to finally apply our finishing coat of Rubio Mono Coat. I think these tables turned out quite well for my first ever resin pours, but there's definitely a lot that I learned about wood and about making these tables during the process that will ensure that the next ones I make will be 10 times better for sure. They look great on the surface, but these tables would get laughed at by any experienced woodworker. Now we need somewhere to fasten our tables to the wall. The frame of this table will also act as support for the center of the mattress area when the bed is on the floor. The plan here is a double hinge system whereby the table has its own leg attached to it. So the table is supported by not only the hinge on the wall, but also the leg that matches the aesthetic of the table itself. And that leg will essentially turn into a wall art piece once it's up in the folded position, which I think is a nice touch, a nice capstone to the living room area and really adds kind of a nice natural earthy feel to what otherwise is kind of a modern apartment style vibe. By this point, kind of see the light at the end of the tunnel. Literally been visualizing this bed in my head for almost two years now. And it seems like a pretty straight and easy line from here to completion. This Murphy bed table bench thing is represents the last significant piece of furniture that I need to build in my truck. There was a reason I saved this project for the last one. I knew that this was gonna be the most complex, the most difficult, 
require the most thought, most prototyping, and most testing out of all of them. But I also kind of wanted to make this the most complex. I wanted to make it even harder than I knew it was going to be originally. I wanted to go above and beyond, as if all the other special engineered components in my truck aren't something that you haven't seen for the first time ever. I had to push this one to the limit. Special shout out to all of my loyal supporters over at technobarbarian.locals.com. If you want to know more about how I built this truck, if you want to get consulting on your own build, or you want to just join a community of van enthusiasts, we got a bunch of people building their own box trucks over at my technobarbarian.locals.com private community. Go join up there today. couldn't find any of the special 3 8 inch screws that I needed to complete the hinge assembly on this table so I had to order some online. While I was waiting for those to arrive I fashioned up a little mini bookcase to occupy that empty space that we had to remove from the bed frame on the wall. After that it was just a matter of attaching the leg to the table itself with those hinges and then cleaning everything up in terms of those pocket holes that I made. I filled these pocket holes with wooden dowels for the first time. I was trying out that new technique. It seemed to work out pretty good. Got those covered in wood putty and then covered with a nice coat of paint to make sure that there were no screws visible. With everything on the table finally set and in place with measurements that are good, everything's working properly, I go ahead and trim the excess off the tabletop. To keep the table fastened in the upright position, I 3D printed a plastic clip that would latch shut and allow me to easily open it without making too much of a visual obstruction to the overall aesthetic. After reattaching our gas struts, I went through and applied a layer of caulk to the gaps between the bed frame and the table frame. I also added a 3D printed clip to the bottom of the table to make sure that the entire piece would stay in place when the Murphy bed tips down to go into sleeping position. And here's the first test of the fully completed unit going down into bed mode. As you could hear, the table did not stay fastened in, which means I probably need to make some different clips. But while the bed was down, I figured I would throw the mattress on there, make sure that everything fits with the four inch memory foam mattresses that I'm planning on using for the bed portion of the Murphy bed. These are basically two of the same mattress that I'm already using in the mom's attic portion put together to make a queen size bed. Swapping out the clips I made for some much beefier versions proved to be sufficient for keeping the table in position all the way through the full deployment of the Murphy bed. Leaving us finally with a functional Murphy bed, Murphy table, and Murphy bench. And instead of saying that every single time I have to give a van tour or explain what I built, I'm just gonna go ahead and call this thing the all wall. Dining room, living room, and a bedroom for the low, low price of only nine inches off your existing wall.